Memory is the stuff of our brains. The agents of memory are neurons, receiving a barrage of information all day, organizing into neuronal networks, forming memories. While we sleep, the fluid network that bathes the brain supports a pruning process that removes miscellany while retaining memories that improve our fitness, short-term to meet the next day's challenges, long-term to survive the decades. The smallest living agents of the ocean are its micrometer-sized bacteria, filling each drop of seawater by the thousands, if not millions, forming interactive networks within a fluid medium that alters them over time. What if we merge these concepts? What if we think of the ocean as Earth's brain, its smallest entities as memory agents? A growing group of us believe that the concept of ocean memory is well worth exploring in all its aspects, from art to science, metaphor to reality, physics to life. We don't begin this exploration from scratch. Marine mammals are known to generate their own memories, while patterns of ocean circulation, swirling eddies, are recognized as having memory of the conditions of past locations. Personally, I begin from another perspective, the sense that my whole life has been the pursuit of ocean memory, without having those words to describe it. From a young classical pianist, to microbiologist, to veteran Arctic oceanographer. Imagine that. So I wish to share with you this evening the draft of a sonata in four movements, under composition with fellow musicians and scientists by converting ocean data sets to sound, not yet ready to hear, only to be partially represented by words and images this evening. There is some irony to my role in this work, as I have a progressive genetic hearing loss knowing that I will need to carry forward memories, my memories of sound, just as the ocean eddies carry forward their memories of warmer times. Ice crystals form in nanoseconds as seawater chills below the freezing point in polar winter. They rise to the surface and consolidate there, expelling liquid brine in the process some onto the top of the thin ice, where it freezes in the even colder atmosphere, forming frost flowers. The lighter frozen water remains at the sea surface, growing through winter into a meter-thick ice cover over the ocean. And the rest of the brine, well, inside the ice cover, a network of trapped brine forms, creating liquid-filled space for microbes to inhabit microbes that survive the freezing process by producing a gelatinous antifreeze that keeps their memory habitat liquid, even when the ice is deeply frozen in winter and appears solid. On the underside of the ice cover, the ice is flushed by the ever-moving ocean, which receives the brine expelling downwards from the ice as it grows thicker. The very formation of an ice cover over an ocean thus forms denser, heavier water that on a much grander scale sinks and becomes the deep blue sea, filling the depths of the ocean, circling the rest of the planet. And so the deep sea is born in polar reason, regions. It carries the memory of its childhood in the form of unique and measurable imprints of temperature and salinity. Astronomical numbers of bacteria are involved in this birth and flow of the ocean. They pass through the annual gauntlet of freezing into the ice and thawing out of it, sinking and flowing with the greater water masses, carrying the genetic memory of cold and salt adaptation driven by polar sea ice formation. 
even as they end up somewhere else. Coelia, the name of a genus of cold adapted marine bacteria, first found transiting the cold depths of a subtropical ocean, appeared to have come from the Arctic, for its closest relatives live there, and indeed has since been found in sea ice at both poles. Coelia was triggered to bloom in the deep Gulf of Mexico, in the deep oil plume that developed following the Deepwater Horizon disaster. The antifreeze that it produces when in the brine network of sea ice, to keep that habitat open and unfrozen through the coldest of winter times, serves another purpose in the Gulf of Mexico as a natural oil dispersant. Childhood memories turn to adult actions to survive the latest threat. Then there is the vast ocean seafloor, repository of so many long-term memories. Particulate matter washed from land to sea and generated in the ocean by microscopic plants, the phytoplankton, rains to the seafloor and accumulates there over long periods of time. It gets mixed up on the seafloor and served as food for bottom dwellers. But some memories pass through this feeding gauntlet and remain in the older sediments that become buried over time. Sediments compact and over millions of years thicken to kilometer depths. The residual organics no longer degrade and the microbes do not die, but sleep in this vast, deep subsurface realm with their memories of the ocean above. Their memories are triggered by local injections of hydrothermal fluids from deep magmatic chambers, and they come to life again until the subsurface geodynamics calm and sleep returns. We cannot ex experience this deep subsurface biosphere, but we do have windows into it through the seafloor vents releasing its hydrothermal fluids and supporting the fantastic chemosynthetic tube worm communities that appear as aliens in our own ocean. But it is deep below the seafloor that the greatest mysteries exist, and some of the oldest memories of the planet and the origins of life are recorded. For the ocean remembers our planet's birth and that it is not alone. Before life existed or could stabilize and evolve, the ocean was forming under very dynamic and chaotic conditions, endless bombardments of the planet evaporating the nascent ocean each time it tried to form, until finally things calmed enough for the ocean to stabilize, even as the planet continued to degas through it. The ocean remembers these early times through its continued eruptive expressions on the seafloor, these black smokers. Memory flashes to 4.3 billion years ago when the ocean first formed. Our ocean is not alone. There is a collective ocean memory in our solar system among its six sibling oceans, all holding memories of the formation of parent, planet, or moon, all ice-covered. Europa's ocean is larger than our own, yet so far inaccessible to us, for its ice cover is kilometers, not meters, thick. This ocean exists because of tidal forcing, the pull and stretch that comes while orbiting a mother planet as huge as Jupiter, generating an internal source of heat that melts the ice. Quoting from a 19th century Inuit hunter, white men think of ice as frozen water, but Inuit think of water as melted ice. To us, Ice is the natural state. We have much to learn from the Inuit. Sedna, goddess of the sea. Abused and rejected by an elder when she was human. Angry over her unkempt, dirtied hair, symbol of this abuse. Calmed only when her hair was tended and cleaned. 
To feed their communities, the elder hunter would have to dive into cold waters, into her realm, to comb and clean her hair before she would allow her sea of marine mammals to be hunted as food. She, the ocean, moved beyond her troubled memories of humankind, their trashing of her realm to support human survival only when they returned regularly to make amends to clean the waters. We ask a lot of our ocean, already soaking up as much CO2 as possible, already hiding our trash for as long as possible, some types of it never before seen by the ocean. Are we risking ocean dementia with our behaviors? The loss of memories that could help us to survive? Can a new perspective on our ocean, one respecting it as Earth's brain and source of memory, help us to do better, to survive longer, to find humility? For the ocean holds far greater and more profound memories than of what we have wrought. <laughs>